I uh, was sitting back there and I was realizing that either this month or next month, I'm celebrating 20 years of ministry. And uh, as I reflected on that, I was reflecting on the message that I'm going to share, really as part two of what Jeff shared. And in 20 years of ministry, I've seen a lot of different things. I've seen uh, some things that have been magnificent, seen wonderful things, seen wonderful ministries and ministers, and I've seen some things that are not so wonderful. And I've seen some things that have confused me. I've seen greatly gifted ministers that behind the scenes there was a dark side to ministry. And I wondered to myself, as I studied church history, how men or women of God could be used so marvelously with their gifts, and then they stumble in some other areas, and it like destroys their gifts or destroys their ministry, and you wonder if they were even saved to start with. But then when you talk to the people that had been in their meetings, that had been miraculously healed or touched by God or transformed, you knew their ministry was real because only the Holy Spirit could do those things. And so for years, I've been perplexed. I've been confused. And for the last several weeks, I've been studying this subject. And just in the last couple of weeks, I felt like the Lord finally released me to teach biblically on this subject. So, with no further ado, we're going to talk about three different faith streams tonight. Three different faith streams. Now, we're saved by grace through faith, not at works as any man can boast. But how do we get saved? Well, God gives to each person, Romans 12, 3, the measure of faith. He didn't say one person gets more than another. We all start off with the measure. It's a free gift. Every non-believer has the measure of faith. But once we get saved, that measure that we received can grow. We grow from faith to faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing and hearing by the word, word of God. God. So that type of faith, the measure of faith or saving faith, what happens with that? We get it as a free gift, whether believer or non-believer. Once we activate or exercise it, it begins to grow. When you got... Uh, born again, you got some spiritual muscles. Just like when you were born, you were born with muscles. Right? But why is it that some people look stronger than me? <laughs> Could it be because they've exercised their muscles and I haven't exercised mine in the same fashion? Why is it that some Christians appear to have stronger faith than others? If we all start off with the same measure, is it because we haven't exercised our faith? So the measure of faith grows by hearing the word of God. So the saving faith or the measure of faith grows by the word. But now let's talk about another kind of faith. Let's talk about the gift of faith. Turn with me, if you will, to Rome, or 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Because if salvation comes as a gift, right, we do nothing for it, what about the gift of faith? If I give you a gift at the door, tonight many of you receive a gift of a flower as mothers, right? Did you do anything for it? No, you received the gift, right? If somebody gives you a birthday gift or somebody walks up and gives you a gift, it's not a reward, it's a gift, freely given, and all you have to do is receive. Well, the gift of faith, or the gifts of the Spirit, are freely given by God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, it simply says this, and if we'll really start in verse 1, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. If we go up to verse 7, it says, But the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is given to every man, to profit with all its for other people's profit. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. That's a gift. Another is the word of knowledge. That's a gift. Number, another is faith by the same Spirit. So here we're talking about a gift of faith. What did you do to receive it? Nothing. It's a gift. Now what does the gift of faith do? It produces supernatural works. A couple of weeks ago I shared an illustration 
of the difference between what was illustrated as a Christmas tree, and we use the word Christmas tree because everybody's seen a Christmas tree. What is underneath a Christmas tree in most situations? Presents. Gifts. When we look at the Christmas tree, has anybody ever walked up to the Christmas tree and said, oh, Christmas tree, Christmas tree, thank you for producing those gifts for me? <laughs> that would be foolish, wouldn't it? Nobody looks at the tree and says, oh, that's a beautiful Christmas tree. Look at the gifts that it produced. No, you look on the gift, and if it's your name on the gift, you open the gift and you find out who the gift is from. And then you go thank the person who put the gift under the tree. We don't bow down and worship the tree, right? We don't even thank the tree for the gift. The tree is attractive. It's a symbol, but we go back to the giver and we thank him or her for that which was assigned to us and place there for safekeeping under that tree. When somebody has a gift of healing, it's because God placed that gift under them as a tree of righteousness, a planting of the Lord. And when that person lays hands on us, it's God that has put our name on that gift mm -hmm. in that moment. And he gave us that gift through the individual. Mm -hmm. It's a gift. And so for us to go back to the person and thank them for giving us the gift would be missing the mark. Mm -hmm. But rather go back to the giver of the gift, mm -hmm. Jesus, yeah. and thank him for our healing. Thank him for the word of knowledge. Thank him for the prophetic utterance. Thank him yeah. for delivering us from something that we needed yeah. to be delivered from. They may, may have been used by the Lord, but they're simply the conduit. Somebody asked me the other day, they were healed uh, in, uh, I got a phone call down in California, and it was a voice message. The guy's name was Randy, and he says, uh, David, I've got somebody who has a need, and he said, <clears throat> he said, I, I couldn't help but share. He said, you know, you prayed for me, and, and I know it wasn't you like you told me. I know you said you're the hose and he's the water. He said, but but we have need of a hose again. <laughs> You're connected with the water. My friend needs, when can we set up a time to call? And this guy had been healed of herniated discs instantly. And, uh, and so I called him back to set up a time where we could pray for that person. But I love the fact that he recognizes the tree where he can go to get the gift, but he recognizes that the tree didn't produce the gift. The tree just happens to know the person who will place them there with people's names on them. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Let's talk about a pear tree. When you go to a pear tree, what do you see on it? Pears. 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 And do you see an apple tree? Apples. An apple. And if you see an orange tree? Oranges. 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 A tree is known by its fruit. 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 Does the tree bear, yield, or produce the fruit? Yes. Yes, yes it does. So tonight, what I want to share is the difference between gifts and fruit. Gifts represent the power of God, the anointing of God. Amen? Yes. They, recognize, they, rec they, they uh, represent a person or a tree's calling. The signs of an, of an, of an apostle are clearly seen. You know, some people... You see their business cards, apostle or prophet, you know, and you're like, you know, this guy must have come from a nonprofit organization. <laughs> There's been no accurate prophecy came through in the last 30 years. You know, how did they get that title? Right. You know, somebody gets an apostle name, you're like, well, where are the signs that I'm an apostle? Where signs and wonders and healings and deliverances and new churches being planted. You know, if they don't have those signs in their life, it doesn't match up with the title, right? Mm -hmm. Well, here's the thing. Just because God does things through a person with apostolic signs and wonders doesn't necessarily mean that that person is right with God. Okay, we're going to go somewhere tonight. <laughs> we're going to go somewhere tonight. I know a lot of anointed men and women of God in 20 years. I have seen creative miracles. I have seen gold teeth form. I have seen blind eyes pop open. Friends of mine have raised the dead. Thousands of souls have been led to Christ. And some of these men and women of God have
have stellar character. They have cultivated a relationship with God. And when they walk into the room, the presence of God is on them. The joy, the fruit of the Spirit, that's love, joy, peace, faith, and faithfulness is there. Meekness, temperance, patience, self-control, it's there. Other people I know that are used mightily of God, I'm not as equally impressed with. But never forget that they are called of God and speak not against the Lord of the Lord. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Right. Question. Samson, called of God? Yes. 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 Anointed of God? Yes. yes. Did he have the character of God? No. Not always. 20 years he was in ministry as judge over Israel. 20 years. Yet he's in and out of the bed with a harlot. Mm -hmm. Finally ends up with his head in the lap of Delilah, the hairdresser, and gets his locks clipped off, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. yeah. Ends up grinding in the house of Dagon in bondage with no eyes. God has a way of dealing with his servants that he's anointed, mm -hmm. that he's gifted. When he repented, he took out more Philistines in his death under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, God's power, mm -hmm. than he did during his life. Mm -hmm. So when a man or a woman of God is anointed and gifted of God, thank God for the gifts that they're operating in. Be careful you don't esteem them too high. Lest if you find out something about their character that might be weighed in the balances and found wanting, you're not disappointed and bewildered in ministry. Because they're just human beings. Mm -hmm. At the same time, careful you don't put your mouth on them. Mm -hmm. Because you never know when God might anoint them again with the jawbone in their hand and they might kill a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of that ass. Mm -hmm. King Saul. Was he anointed to be king? Yes. Absolutely. He was, wasn't he? Yes. Did he have the character of God? No. No, he didn't, did he? Yet he was still king, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. When somebody is put into office by the Lord, it's by God's divine design and by his gifting. And the gifts are not for the king or the priest or the prophet or the apostle. The gifts are for the people that God has put that person in front of. Or in contact with. Now again, we don't want to speak against one, but we also don't want to overly exalt one either, do we? Mm -hmm. We want to exalt the giver of the gift. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because he alone is the source. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we've got some other examples in scripture. A people that had tremendous fruit, the fruit of the spirit, this love, joy, and peace. Remember Anna, the prophetess, mm -hmm. yeah. who was in the temple of God? For years praying and fasting that God would reveal Jesus the consolation of Israel you think that woman didn't carry the presence of God yet nowhere in scripture do we see her doing signs and wonders do we Enoch walked with God and was no more because God took him he had the character of God character or fruit the fruit of faith is developed through cultivating a relationship. The gifts of God are simply representing the power of God. And the measure of faith is something that grows through reading the word, doesn't it? Let me give you this. The seven sons of Siva, you remember them in the book of Acts? They were out casting demons in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. They could cast out demons and didn't even know God. That's how powerful the name of Jesus is. I've seen non-believers cast out demons for false religions when the name of Buddha or Allah didn't work. They called on Jesus, the power of God hit. Shook, shook them. They're like, wow, there's power in that name. And they still didn't get saved. True story. That's how power... See, it's a gift. Mm -hmm. It's not relationship. It's not fruit. Mm -hmm. Now, what's more important, gifts or fruit? Three. Both. <laughs> Both. Trick question. <laughs> Let me share with you why. There's nine gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. 
And there's nine fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Now, illustration, Old Testament. The high priest, once a year, would go through the outer courts of the temple, into the inner courts of the temple, and then he would go behind the thick veil that was 20 feet tall, 40 feet wide, and 4 inches thick of a black curtain. And they would tie a rope around his leg, I think, foot, I think it was, his ankle. And, and here's why they would do it. Because if he had sin in his life, when he walked in to where the Ark of the Covenant, the glory of God, was billowing the presence and the holiness of God, that he could die in the presence of God just that quick. If you don't believe me, ask Ananias and Sapphira. In the New Testament, I might add, who dropped dead in the presence of God for lying to the Holy Spirit during an apostolic age where God's presence and power were manifesting in the first century church. But here's what they had. He had the priestly garment on, and around the base of his robe was this. An ornate wooden pomegranate. Pomegranate is what? Fruit. 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 And in between each pomegranate, there was a bell. And when that wooden pomegranate would hit the bell, it would ring or chime. And so around the base of his outfit, there was a fruit and a bell, a fruit and a bell. And they were perfectly one next to the other. What happens when you have two pieces of wooden ornate fruit bounce against each other? Makes a thud, doesn't it? Thud, click, click, thud, thud. Not very exciting, is it? What happens when you have two bells that hit each other? Clank, chime. clank, clank. You ever hit two bells together? They don't chime. They clink. They clang mm -hmm. like a resounding brass or a clanging cymbal. But when you have the ornate fruit hitting the bell, it rings. And this is what would happen. The priest, the high priest alone, would go behind the temple. And this is how they knew he was still alive back there. They could hear ring, ring, chime, 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 chime. If that ever happened, they'd kind of pull on the thing and might pull back a little bit. But they weren't going to go back there and find him because they hadn't consecrated themselves. They consecrated themselves enough for the outer courts. They may have even consecrated themselves for the inner courts. But without permission, back in the Old Testament, you didn't go into the Holy of Holies because you could drop dead. Just like the Israelites didn't go up on Mount Horeb, only Moses went up. But thank God for Jesus, who rent the temple curtain from top to bottom. And he said, now you, as my children, can come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy and grace in the time of need. We can enter boldly into his presence. But back then, they had the bells and they had the pomegranate. Bells, I would submit, are symbolic of gifts. And the pomegranates are symbolic of fruit. And here's what happens. If we just have fruit, it's like a thud, thud, thud. If we just have gifts, it's like a clang, clang, clang. But with the gifts and the fruit combined. <laughs> We have the chime and the symphony of God that everybody has music in their ears. So once we're saved with the measure of faith, it's our job to get into the word and to grow in the faith. We then get into presence, the presence of God in intimacy. We begin to cultivate that relationship. And what shows up in our life? We begin to bear fruit. And we begin to understand God's calling and his gifts. Yes. And we begin to understand that the gifts are not for us, they're through us. Mm -hmm. They're for others. Right. And when we begin to ask God for more gifts, what we're saying is we're saying, Lord, I really want to have less time for myself and I want to serve other people more. That's good. And when we begin to spend time with God, we begin to minister to him. And his character in his presence begins to rub off on us. When we go out into the world, we begin to release his gifts to the people. Because the gifts are from him to them. And we just happen to be the conduit or the hose that sprays them 
with the living water of Christ. The seven sons of Seba release some gifts. But you know what will happen if you've got the gifts without the character? You'll have some holes in your hedge of protection. And a serpent will come through and bite you. And the seven sons of Seba, when that demon in that man said, Paul I know, and Jesus I know, but who are you? And the spirit in whom the man was leapt on them, overcame them, and beat them, and they left naked and wounded. Gifts will only get you so far. We must have relationship with the Lord to protect ourselves, not just against the enemy, but to protect ourselves against ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, the biggest enemy is not the devil. Yeah. It's not the world. <clears throat> your biggest enemy, and my biggest enemy, your biggest enemy is you, yeah. and my biggest enemy is me. Mm -hmm. Old Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't make you do it. You were in agreement with him when he invited you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nobody goes out and says, I just fell into sin. <laughs> You dressed for it. Oh. You put on the right perfume or cologne for it. You planned it. And when God tried to stop you in the process, you ignored the warnings. Samson didn't go down to the Philistine camp window shopping. If you go down to the Philistine camp, you better be going for war. Otherwise, you'll be taken care of. Moses had gifts. Moses had fruit. Scripture says Moses was the meekest man on all the earth. Did Moses have gifts with his staff? Who was more gifted than Moses? His staff would turn into a serpent. He could strike, lice would appear. Moses was so anointed and gifted to deliver the people that the magicians of Egypt that were falsely gifted couldn't compete with him after the third miracle. And even they said, what Moses is doing, this is the finger of God. Moses, scripture says, was the meekest man on all the earth. He was power under self-control. He exemplified both. Gifts and fruit out of relationship. But there came a time in his ministry where he stumbled. Does anybody remember where it was? Moses struck the rock at the leading of the Holy Spirit the first time. And out of relationship and giftedness, he obeyed God, struck the rock, and water came out, which was a gift to meet the needs of the people, wasn't it? Who were thirsty in the wilderness. Do you know what happens to ministers? When we spend more time ministering to the people than we spend ministering unto the Lord, we lose relationship and we start relying upon our gifts mm -hmm. instead of our relationship. Mm -hmm. If Samson can be in the bed with a harlot and then when he gets in trouble, shake himself, the anointing come on him, and he can go rip a gate off the city that history says weighed 2,200 pounds and then run to Gaza which is 38 miles, 